throughout my history. Faithfulness is what beside me. The winter storms make way for spring. Every season from where I'm standing, I'll see. Consistent fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, or fear will leave. You leave my heart. And you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. It's all over my life. I see your promises in the all over my life. It's all. provision, Lord, that you care for the sparrow, that you care for us, that all of our needs are, are met by you, Lord. God, that we find our, our satisfaction in you, in you alone. God, we thank you so much that you come and dwell with us, Lord. We pray that you would be honored, that you would receive our praises this, this evening. to say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done, for what you're doing. So 
Holy Spirit, fill this place, God. We invite you right now. Lord, fill this room. Father, we love you.
there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name so let the redeemed the Lord say so sing of his promises This series in 2 
Chronicles, we're calling it the faithfulness of God. And you're going to see the faithfulness of God in so many ways tonight. You're going to see through the life of Jehoshaphat, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Jehoshaphat, how God's faithfulness is just revealed sometimes in ways that we never even think of. So it's going to take us two weeks to get through the reign of Jehoshaphat. So tonight we're going to look at chapter 17 through the third verse of chapter 19 in a study that we're calling A Great King Clouded by a Good Desire. And so last week we were studying the life and the reign of King Asa. He was a very good king. And because of his personal faith and his dependence on the Lord, God really prospered the nation of Judah in so many ways. But the problem with Asa is that he was like so many other kings that he started well, but he didn't end well. And that happens in the life of a lot of Christians, men and women. You get off to a good start, but then some success. And sometimes it's the accumulation of, of earthly wealth. We stop being dependent on God. And when those things happened to him, he made a sinful decision. And he experienced the hand of God's discipline. And because he was not a teachable man... God's discipline drove him to a place where he became hard-hearted. And we read that he spent the rest of his life in a broken relationship with God. In fact, he even died of a terrible disease. And instead of praying for healing, he called for doctors. And so I just want to challenge you, never be like Asha. So that brings us to chapter 17. And if you look down at verse 1, it begins with these words, Then Jehoshaphat, his son reigned in his place. And over the next two weeks, as we study the life of Jehoshaphat, I think we're going to see just one simple thing. And that's that in spite of the fact that he made some unwise decisions, he really is considered one of Judah's greatest kings. So I think you'll be encouraged by much of what you see tonight. Even his failures are a bit encouraging because of what motivated the failure that we'll read about tonight. So let's start in chapter 17 where we'll focus on Jehoshaphat's strengths. And Jehoshaphat did a series of things that resulted in Judah's continued growth and her continued strength. And I'm going to give you three. I want you to notice here in verse 1 that he prioritized national security. Notice that he strengthened himself against Israel. He placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah, and he set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. And so I've told you this a couple of times over the last few studies, but ever since Solomon's death, Israel has been a divided nation. So you have the ten northern tribes, and they called themselves Israel. And then you had the two southern tribes, and they called themselves Judah. But the thing that we often forget is that they weren't just experiencing a division in the kingdom. They were experiencing what you and I would call a civil war. And they were at war between the Jewish people who lived in the north and the Jewish people who lived in the south. And as we continue through this book, we see that the ten northern tribes kept going further and further into their idolatry, further and further away from their relationship with the Lord, further and further from the commandments of the Lord. And Jehoshaphat really understood that their cousins to the north posed a spiritual threat to them. They posed a military threat. They posed a political threat. And so as we read there in verses 1 and 2, he exercised the wisdom of a good king, and he secured the borders, he fortified the cities, and he made sure that if any of the cousins from the north decided they were going to come down, that they were going to have a fight on their hands. And you know what? That's one of the marks of a good leader. A good national leader understands from Genesis chapter 11 that God has given every nation sovereignty. 
And if a nation wants to say, hey, in order to come into our land, you have to adhere to specific rules and specific guidelines. And if you don't, you can't come here. And so Jehoshaphat made it very clear that if anybody was going to come from the north to the south, which we've been reading over the last couple of weeks, happened a lot, it had to be for the right reasons because they wanted to seek the God of Israel. I keep, it's hard to use these terms, Israel and Judah, but Israel describes all of the Jewish people and Yahweh was their God. And so the second thing that he did is he prioritized personal sanctification. And I think this one is really, really cool. His wisdom here is really revealed in verses 3 through 6. He knew that Israel's idolatry threatened Judah's spiritual well-being. And even though he had a strong military presence on the northern border, he knew that that is not what defines a nation's strength. He understood, and and now he's going to exemplify that a nation's real strength is found in her relationship with God. Washington, are you listening? So, verse 3, he says, Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but he sought the God of his father, and he walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. Jump ahead to verse 6, please. It says, His heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and the wooden images from Judah. Now look up at the screen because I want to read to you the part of verse 3 from the New American Standard Bible. Where it says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days. As Ezra is writing this, he's reminding us that in David's early days, David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man walking in personal sanctification and holiness and uprightness. Ezra is referring to the days before David fell into the horrid sins of adultery and murder. That was written by a Bible commentator named John Trapp. Look at what Spurgeon wrote. Up on the screen, he said, Have you ever noticed the career of David? What a happy life David's was up to one point. But that hour when he walked on the roof of his house and he saw Bathsheba and he gave way to his unholy desires, put an end to the happy days of David. You recognize him as the same man, but his voice is broken. His music is deep bass. He cannot reach one high note of the scale. From the hour in which he sinned, he began to sorrow more and more. So will it be with us if we are not watchful. Powerful words from Charles Spurgeon that we should all listen to. So what we're seeing here is that Jehoshaphat's personal relationship with God resulted in what we would call personal holiness. He had a relationship with God and it impacted the way that he lived. And then his personal holiness was the foundation from which he led the nation. And now in verse 6, we read that he delighted himself in the Lord, so much so that he went around and he destroyed the high places where the idols were worshipped. And then I want you to notice the result of all this. We're backing up now to verse 5. And it says, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. And so he's got a strong military, and now he's got this strong, godly life from which he's leading the nation. And God looks down and he says, I am well pleased, and I am going to establish the nation of Judah under Jehoshaphat's leadership in order to show him that he's on the right track and he's doing good. And then an interesting thing we see also, if you keep reading, the people of Judah appreciated Jehoshaphat's godly leadership. And I want you to notice how they showed it. This is something that you don't see a lot in the scriptures. It says, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat 
and he had riches and honor in abundance. And so the nation was prospering, the people were prospering, and they said, listen, we understand that we're prospering because our king is seeking God, God is well pleased in the way he's leading, and our whole nation is being blessed, and we want to give back to the man who's responsible for some of our blessing and prosperity. And you'll remember that Jesus said that a workman is worthy of his wages, And so here, the people of Judah, it appears that God put it on their heart to be generous and to express their gratitude to to Jehoshaphat by giving to him generously. And then the third thing I want to show you is that he prioritized national sanctification. So we read in the beginning that the borders were fortified, so the, the nation is strong militarily. He prioritized personal sanctification, so his throne was established by God. The idols are torn down. But Jehoshaphat knew something here that I think a lot of the other kings neglected, or maybe they just didn't pay attention to. Jehoshaphat looks and he says, listen, we're in a time of reform. We were worshiping idols, but we've torn down those high places, and the people are doing good. But he says, there's something missing. It's not enough to stop doing bad. The people need to be taught God's word so that they understand how to live a life that pleases God. And so this is where we're about to see this reform begin to turn into a revival as the people begin to hear God's word. Look at verse 7. In the third year of his reign, he sent his leaders, Ben-Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahal, Shemiramoth, and that's a tough one right there, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, here's another tough one, Tobadonijah, the Levites. And with them, Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and they taught the people. You see, other kings, including Jehoshaphat's father Asa, had led reforms. But none of them really led a revival. And this turned into a revival because now the word of God has been brought by teaching priests and by other Levites and leaders into every community. I want you to just picture Jehoshaphat and he calls together qualified men and he sends them out in every community to basically start Bible studies. He just tells these men, go out and get the word of God into the hearts and the lives and the minds of the people. And now, because they had forsaken their idols they're ripe to be discipled and taught, and they're being taught how to walk in the light of God's Word. And we've talked about this a few times, both on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights recently, that it's never enough just to stop doing something that the Bible says is sinful. The Bible says that there's a second thing, which is then to gather with the people of God and to do good in that fellowship, studying the Word and and learning. If you remember years before this, Solomon wrote these words, and they appear in Proverbs 14, 34. Solomon said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And Jehoshaphat was taking steps to secure Judah militarily, politically, but most importantly, spiritually. He understood what Solomon wrote. He he understood that if you can focus on getting a nation into a position of righteousness before the Lord, that God would establish that nation. And so he's working hard to make sure that they're not just militarily strong, they're not just politically strong, but that the most important thing is this nation was spiritually strong because they knew and they were living the word of God. And so notice verse 10. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, 
so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. I want you to let that verse set in for a minute. He wasn't just talking about the size and the power of the military, although he's going to do that in a minute. He just told us, Ezra just told us, that because the Jewish people in Judah were now being taught God's word, they were becoming disciples of the Lord who lived according to the word of God. The nations around them feared I think that's amazing. It was the word of God that was causing the nations around them to have fear and to not make war. And as you look at that, I know questions are going through your mind. Like, what does that look like? Why were these nations saying, hey, the Jews are studying their Bible, so we better not go to war against them? You know, you think about that, and you go, that doesn't make sense. Adam Clark, in his commentary wrote these words, and man, this just drives it home. It sheds so much light. He says, Thus the nation became thoroughly instructed in their duty to God, to the king, and to each other. They became, therefore, as one man. They were unified. And then notice what else he says. And against a people thus united... On such principles, no enemy could be successful. And I believe what Ezra's trying to teach us is exactly what Adam Clark wrote in his commentary, that when you get a group of people that are like-minded and unified because of their agreement on the Word of God, and they know how to treat the king, they know how to treat each other, they know how to have a relationship with God, other people look on and say, that is not the kind of people you want to mess with. That is a people serious about their relationship with God. And I'll just tell you this. I've been part of the Calvary Chapel family of churches for 30-some years now. When I returned to the Lord after a season of backsliding, we accidentally ended up in a Calvary Chapel and have never left. And one of the reasons why is because for the last 60 years the vision that Pastor Chuck imparted into the Calvary Chapel movement was basically what we just read about. Find qualified men, send them out into a community and have them just start Bible studies where they simply teach the word so that people know God's word and they know how to have a relationship with God. They know how to have a relationship with authority figures. They know how to have a relationship with one another. And when you have a church filled with those kind of people, Satan kind of steps back and says, you know what? I don't know that I want to mess with them too often because they are strong in the Lord. Now, he does mess with us, amen? I'm not saying that we're something special and that Satan's like, hey, hands off over there as he tends to mess with me quite a bit. But what I am saying is I don't think we're easy prey for the enemy. I think we know his tactics well enough. When something starts in our life, we go, aha, Satan just overplayed his hand, and I know what's going on here. And it's because we have been so well taught. I want to thank God for Pastor Chuck Smith and what God did through him and in the Calvary Chapel movement in my life, personally. Because I was floundering, I was a mess, and when we came in from out of the cold, so to speak... Kelly was a brand new believer. I was a backsliding believer that had just rededicated my life to the Lord. And sitting in Calvary Chapel, where we spent over 17 years in Albuquerque, we heard the word and we were taught so well. And it bore so much fruit in our lives. And I just thank God for that. Join me at verse 11. It says, Also some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents of silver as tribute. Let's just pause right there. The Philistines and others that we'll read about later. Arabians, notice in the next sentence, brought him flocks. They brought him 7,000 700 rams and 7,700 male goats. The Philistines and 
various people groups, Arabians here, they're looking on and they're saying there is something unique going on in the nation of Judah. The people are experiencing a revival and when people are being obedient to their God and they are walking in a strong relationship with their God, we're not going to go mess with those people. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start taking gifts to their king because we, we want them to like us. And in a sense, what we're reading about is they were paying tax, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Verse 12, Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful, and he built fortresses and storage cities in Judah. He had much property in the cities of Judah, and the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. These are their numbers. According to their father's houses of Judah, the captains of thousands, Adna, the captain, and with him 300,000 mighty men of valor. And next to him was Jehonanon, Je Jehohanan, the captain, and with him 280,000. And next to him was Amasiah, the son of Zikri, who willingly offered himself to the Lord. And with him, 200,000 mighty men of valor. Of Benjamin, Eliada, a mighty man of valor, and with him 200,000 men armed with bow and shield. And next to him was Jehozabad, and with him 180,000 prepared for war. These served the king besides those the king put in the fortified cities throughout all Judah. So the combination of teaching the people God's word and an army of over a million valiant soldiers, Judah's enemies brought tribute as a sign that Jehoshaphat and Judah had sovereignty over them. And I, I just love that story because it's not about the million man army. It's not about the military. That was mentioned later. The neighboring nations were looking on and saying there is something special going on among the Jewish people and their God is doing amazing things among them and we're just going to be hands off. So closing this chapter, I want to remind everybody that 2024 is another national presidential election. And wouldn't it be awesome for God to raise up a man like Jehoshaphat to be king, well, president in the United States of America? Wouldn't that be great to have a man like that, a man who understands that America needs a strong military, a man that understands that we've got to secure our borders, a man who understands and raises up leaders who walk with God, who's willing to stand against evil and tear down the godless things that go on in the nation, and a man who sees the value in promoting the truths of God's word across the nation. Wouldn't it be great for a man like that? Would you vote for him? I would vote for him. But, but here's the thing that I want to remind you of, because I think a lot of times when we read a story like Jehoshaphat's, we think, we need a king like Jehoshaphat, right? But let's just go back to the way our nation is structured. We don't have a king. The king had ultimate power in Israel. If he woke up one day and he said, you know what, I'm going to go tear down the high places of Baal, who was going to stop him? President of the United States wakes up and says, you know what, I'm going to put a stop to abortion today. Do you know how hard it would be for him to do that? because of the politics and all of that stuff. But the United States of America is structured in a way where the citizens can do those things. And it does begin with prayer, and it does begin with conviction. But when we take our citizenship seriously, then we can accomplish some of the things that we've read about tonight. I'll be specific, going back to what he did. He built strong borders, and you and I need to begin by building borders between our lives and the world that tries to impress its values on us. So we start with that, and then, because we have a relationship with the Lord that produces personal holiness, we should live and serve and do everything we do from that position of personal holiness. And if 
many of us are doing that, then we begin to create more of a national sanctification. We stand against evil, and that holiness guides everything that we do. So I know we all want to wake up one day and vote for somebody who's going to fix everything, but that's not the way our nation works. We'd like to think it works that way. Our nation works when you and I take our citizenship seriously and we exercise our biblical values in the ways that we have uh, the opportunity to do. So chapter 18, if we just go back, we're reminded that, or chapter 17, that Jehoshaphat was a very, very godly man. Chapter 18 is going to remind us that even the most spiritual and godly men are still men and make some pretty serious mistakes sometimes. We're going to read about some very serious mistakes that Jehoshaphat made, but as you consider what motivated him to make these mistakes, you, you can understand and maybe give him a little bit more grace. I'll take you through the whole story here. We're going to call this Jehoshaphat's mistakes here in chapter 18, and I think we're going to see three or four really big ones. But one of the things that I think you need to understand as you read chapter 18, especially if you go back and you read Jehoshaphat's stories within the books of Kings, Jehoshaphat had a real desire to see a reconciliation between Judah and Israel. He looked at history and he realized God created a nation called Israel. He did not create this division. That was the result of some of our kings who had conflicts. And so he has this desire for national unity And what we're about to see is that he's going to allow that to cloud his sense of right and wrong, and it's going to lead him to make a number of mistakes. And so before we get into the chapter, I I just kind of want to throw out maybe a, a blanket statement here, that oftentimes you and I can have motivations and desires that even line up with God's word, But oftentimes we can get ahead of what the Lord's doing or we can somehow think that we can create something and we get out and make a decision and realize I'm doing exactly what Jehoshaphat did. Let let me explain what I mean. Jehoshaphat's first mistake was becoming unequally yoked to an unbeliever. Pick it up in verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. And by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. You may say, well, who's Ahab? Well, Ahab at this time was the king of Israel, and he is the husband of the infamous Jezebel that we've all read about, right? We all know the story of Jezebel. And he came to power around the same time that Jehoshaphat came to power down in Judah. 1 Kings 16 tells us something about him that Ezra doesn't care to share with us here in 2 Chronicles 18. 1 Kings 16 tells us that he was the most wicked king that Israel had ever had up to this point in her existence. So keep that in mind. And we know that Ahab, king of Israel, feared Jehoshaphat, but he also coveted his wealth He coveted his prominence and his power in the region. And what he wanted to do was use him by creating an alliance with him. It's like if I create an alliance, then I can benefit from who he is and what he has. And so Jehoshaphat, at the same time, is looking for opportunities. How can I, as a man of God go to my brother up north, Ahab, and try to work with him in such a way that that our divided nation can once again be reconciled and unified. And so he's looking for these opportunities. And 
a situation comes up where he and Ahab enter into a political alliance when Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram married Athaliah, Ahab, and Jezebel's daughter. So they decide, you know what? We can create this political alliance by my son marrying your daughter. And I know I'm not going to go attack a nation where my daughter lives. She could get hurt. You're not going to attack a nation where your son lives. We're kind of safe here. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote about this. And this is not just dating or marriage. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is business. This is marriage. This is dating. This is any realm of life where yoking, you know, a uh, a tool that takes two animals and hooks them together to accomplish work as a team. Paul says you don't unequally yoke yourself with unbelievers at any time for any reason. And then he gives the reasons. He says, for what fellowship has righteousness, describing the believer, with lawlessness, describing the unbeliever? What communion has Light, there's the believer, with darkness, the unbeliever. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul is quoting again and again Old Testament scriptures. So this just isn't a New Testament concept. This is a biblical concept, Old Testament, New Testament. So Jehoshaphat knew these things, and he knew better than to yoke Judah and Israel. He knew better than to yoke himself with Ahab. And yet, he was so blinded by his desire for unity, he wanted unity so badly that he was willing to make this alliance without seeing any repentance and long-term life change in the king of the north. So sometimes someone will come to me and they'll say, Pastor Randy, I'm... I'm you know, separated from my husband, I'm separated from my wife, and they've contacted me, they want to get back together, they say they're sorry. And I always say, well, that's good, I'm glad they say they're sorry. But are they repentant? What was it that broke up your marriage? What was it that broke up this friendship? And if the other party is responsible, and they have not taken responsibility for that, and they have not repented for that, and they have not had a long period of time to prove their repentance through the bearing of good fruit, you should probably just put things on hold and, and just wait and see what happens. Well, they say they're sorry, I'm going back. And I just kind of make a little note on my calendar. They're going back today. Three weeks, this person will be calling me for another counseling appointment. You know, Pastor Andy, you got any time to meet? I went back to my husband, found out he's still with that woman he was dating. Really? But I thought he was sorry. Oh, he's sorry he got caught and that you're mad, right? So, no, I never speak to people like that. I only do that here in the pulpit. I'm pretty compassionate in the counseling realm. But um, Jehoshaphat was probably saying, you know, Ahab's he's been sending me letters and saying, hey, you know, we should fix this thing, you know? This isn't even between us. This was between like our grandfathers. I don't even know why I don't like you and you don't even know why you don't like me. Let's go have coffee and let's talk about this. And Jehoshaphat comes back from coffee and tells his wife, that Ahab's a nice guy, you know? And the next thing you know, he says, I'm gonna give my daughter to his, or my son to his daughter, you know? and and." What a mess here. But, but let me tell you a second problem. If, if you go back and you compare this account with the account recorded in Kings, you realize that they made this alliance 
And then a lot of years went by where there was no trouble. So Jehoshaphat is able to look and he's saying, see, things are going well. God, God must be okay with this. And then Jehoshaphat's second mistake found in verse 2 is that he allowed himself to be manipulated. Look, after some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with them, and he persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will be with you in the war. So a little history here. Toward the end of Ahab's life, he was engaged in bitter hostilities with some of the Arameans, specifically the Syrians in the Transjordan area. And we know that they had taken Ramoth Gilead, which was one of Israel's cities of refuge. So Ahab flatters Jehoshaphat by hosting this extravagant banquet in his honor. And then He's got him all buttered up and he urges him to join him in this war against the Arameans and against God's will and against probably the Holy Spirit's prompting. Jehoshaphat allows himself to be manipulated into yoking himself and the armies of Judah to the ungodly king Ahab and the idol-worshiping Israelites. I don't know, it doesn't record it, but maybe he just had a bunch of wine that night or something, you know, at the banquet, or he's just, he's given all these gifts. Somehow he's just buttered up and manipulated, and the king of the north says, hey, uh, will you go with us to fight against our enemies? And he's all, heck yeah, let's go to war. But you know what's interesting here? If you're really paying attention to some of the details from the 17th chapter, One of the blessings that God gave to Jehoshaphat as a king was an extended period of peace and no war. And that's what kings like. A secure nation and nobody's attacking. There's no war. And now he allows himself to be manipulated and he gives up that peace that God had given to his nation. He is now a king at war and he's at war with somebody that he's not really in a conflict with. He's taken up somebody else's offense. Jehoshaphat's third mistake was ignoring God's word. And this is a really interesting story. We're going to have to cover a lot of ground quickly. But verse 4, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. In other words, listen, if we're about to go to war, shouldn't we pray and seek God and ask him if we should go to war and maybe inquire of the Lord for some wisdom? And so notice verse 5, the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. These are his prophets. 400 men, and he said to them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So these were false prophets. They were on the king's payroll, and they were basically paid to say whatever the king wanted them to say. That's how they probably stayed alive and got a paycheck every week. But Jehoshaphat, he knows what a real prophet of the Lord sounds like. And something's not right here. So he asked, hey, are there any genuine prophets of the Lord in in Israel? And I love Ahab's answer. Verse 7, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. (laughs) I love that. I hate this guy. Why? Because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Like, hey, it's not nice to talk about other people that way. Look up at the screen, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. We've brought this up quite a few times in our pastoral epistle studies on Sunday. Paul tells Timothy, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We just read the Old Testament equivalent 
to that. And Ahab has surrounded himself with these prophets who basically say whatever he wants them to. But he hated Micaiah because Micaiah told the king what God really said rather than what the king wanted to hear. And this was really an opportunity for Jehoshaphat to speak up and to rebuke Ahab. But instead, notice what he says. He simply says, hey, let not the king say such things. So we see here that he's intimidated. He's in a position where he really is the authority figure, but he's allowing himself to be intimidated. In verse 8, then the king of Israel, this is Ahab, called one of his officers and said, bring Micaiah the son of Imlah, quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne, and they sat at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets, these are the 400 false prophets we just read about, prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of that guy, Hannah, yeah, had made horns of iron for himself. So picture this. He's a prophet who brought a prop. And they're like horns, like the horns of a bull. And he brings these and he says, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. And then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. Now listen, you be a good little prophet, and you don't rock the boat here. Because the king's in a good mood today. The prophets are telling him what he wants to hear. And we don't want you ruining the party for us. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. What a verse. What a, isn't that how Christians should conduct themselves? You know, listen, I'm going to be filled with tact and love. And my words are going to be seasoned with salt. But as the Lord lives, I've got to speak the truth. I can't just be uh, an ear tickler. So then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. Now, is your mind a little bit blown right now? Because he just did what he was told to do. He, He compromised. But check this out. Uh, I lost my place here. There we are, verse 15. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And so the king realized Micaiah is being sarcastic here. He's just saying, Hey, this is what everybody else says. I guess I'm going to say it. And the king says, No, I want you to tell me the truth here. And I want you to notice what he says. Verse 16. He said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. You see, the king was the nation's shepherd. And Micaiah just says, hey, God gave me a vision of what's going to happen if you go to war. And king, what's going to happen is you're going to die on the battlefield. And your men are going to be scattered. It would be better if you didn't go to war and everybody just went home, had dinner, you know. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? No wonder I don't like this guy. He never says anything good. But I want to show you something, and we'll have to touch on this quick because we're running out of time. But Have you ever noticed that whenever non-believers hear believers speaking the truth of God's word, that they then accuse us of evil? You know, if, if a pastor gets up and he says something, anything, he can be commenting on how the definition of marriage has been changed in our society. Anything. We just say something biblical, 
And people that don't believe will then say, see, you guys are filled with hate. You guys are the trouble here. And that's exactly what the king is doing. He's saying Micaiah has spoken evil, but no, he spoke the truth of God's word. 18, verse 18, then Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. What he's saying is, let me tell you how I got this vision that I just gave to you. And he's basically going to say, I I was transported into the throne room of God. Notice he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. He's surrounded by the angels of heaven. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall or, or die at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And we know that this is a fallen angel, a demonic spirit. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail Go out and do so. So Micaiah comes and he says, listen, let me tell you what's going on here. Because the king does not want to hear the true word of the Lord, he has opened himself up to deception. And an evil spirit came before the Lord and said, listen, I'm going to go deceive that man. God says, how are you going to do it? He says, I'm going to speak through the mouths of these 400 prophets. And God says, go ahead, because he's not listening to me. And there's a biblical truth here, and that's that if people want to ignore God and his word, then they open themselves up to demonic deception. And God doesn't say, hey, I'm not going to let that happen. God will protect those who ask him, hey, God, protect my mind, guard my heart, guard my mind. I'm going to put the word in. I'm going to take godly counsel. But when there's godly counsel available and somebody says, you know what, I don't want to hear that, that's when the Lord says, okay, then you become fair game for the other team. You're opening yourself up to demonic deception when you refuse the word of the Lord. And then verse 22, Micaiah now speaks to King Ahab. He says, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. And then Zedekiah, the son of Hena'ana, the guy who had the horns, he went near and he struck Micaiah on the cheek. And he said, which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? A better translation would be, since when did the spirit of the Lord leave me to speak through you? I'm the genuine prophet here. You're the lying prophet. And Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. In other words, Micaiah says, I'm not going to argue with you. On the day when my word comes true, because it's from the Lord, you're going to run for your life. And then verse 25, the king of Israel, Ahab said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in Peace. In other words, put him in jail and give him just enough food to stay alive. And when I come back from this battle, now I'll go deal with him. And Micaiah turns around and says, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And then he said, take heed, all you people. And right now, um, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Ahab, king of Israel, have a decision to make. Am I going to listen to Zedekiah and the 400 prophets? Or am I going to listen to this one guy, Micaiah, who claims to be a lone prophet of the Lord? And the fourth mistake that Jehoshaphat made, it's found here beginning in verse 28, is that he listened to the false prophets. Verse 28, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And obviously their goal was to liberate the city from the Syrians. Verse 29, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I'll disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes 
So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went into battle. What is wrong with Jehoshaphat? I, I mean, you realize what's going on here. Ahab, he's starting to feel a little bit insecure about Micaiah's prophecies. He's like, hey, I, I think this dude is speaking the truth. And if I go into battle wearing my full king's robes, I'm target number one. So he looks at Jehoshaphat and he says, you know what? I'm going to kind of lay low. I'm going to ride around in a chariot dressed like just your average soldier. But you, you wear your robe so that when we win this battle, you get all the glory. And Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, good idea. I don't know. I don't know. Look at verse 30. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots who were with him saying, fight with no one small or great but only with the king of Israel. In other words, he says, listen, guys, don't waste your time just fighting with some of these men. You break through, you find the king, and you assassinate him. Because if we cut off the head of the snake, the snake is dead. All right, let's just go right for the king. No messing around. And so it was, verse 31, when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, it is the king of Israel. So we got a case of mistaken identity here, right? Therefore, they surrounded him to attack. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. And God diverted them from him. For so it was when the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Is God good or what, church? I mean, after this series of four fleshly mistakes, and his life is in jeopardy, the very moment that he cries out to God for help, God delivers him. And he causes the warriors of the enemy to look and to say, hey, that's not the king we want to kill. Leave him alone. And they turn around and, and God rescues him. But in verse 33, we're going to see the faithfulness of God to deal with Ahab because he's thinking, you know what? I have thwarted God's plan. The prophet prophesied that I'm going to die, but I'm not wearing my robe, so no one's going to think to kill me right? I'm getting off scot-free. Verse 33, Ezra says, you're not going to believe this story. He goes, a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Picture a couple of guys up on a hill, right? And they're going, you know, this battle's really boring. There's not a whole lot going on. I'm, I'm just going to let one fly. Whew. What are you guys having for dinner tonight, you know? Guy doesn't even know it. He lets this arrow just randomly fly, it hits the king of Israel between two layers of his armor. The arrow pierces his body, and it turns out to be a kill shot. True to the words spoken by Micaiah the prophet from the Lord, and Ahab dies in battle. Just real quick, verse 34, the battle increased that day. And the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Syrians until evening. So he didn't want his men to know that he was mortally wounded. So he pretends that he's still in the battle. He tells somebody, hey, prop me up and just, you know, make me look alive for a while. And by the time the sun went down, he was dead. And so we see that even though his blasphemy against God. He, he mocked God. He mocked Micaiah's prophecy and he tried to disguise himself and yet God says, you cannot mock me that way. And this random arrow takes him out. So let's conclude this by just looking at chapter 19 verses 1 through 3. We'll, we'll actually restudy this next week as our introduction. But we're going to call this uh, Jehoshaphat's confrontation by God. And so Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king, or to King Jehoshaphat, and we'll pause there for a minute, I, just to kind of rehash things. God had just saved him on the battlefield. It looked like he was going to die. God miraculously saves him and brings him home to Judah. And as he's arriving there in Jerusalem, Jehu the prophet confronts him with the word of the Lord. And this is what he says. He said, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? 
He's referring to Ahab and to the people of Israel. He says, therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. So first, this prophet confronts his ungodly alliance with Ahab and with Israel, and he's told that there are going to be consequences from the Lord, but then the prophet turns around and he commends him for standing against the paganism, and he commends him for his love for the Lord. And now the question is, is Jehoshaphat teachable? How is he going to respond? And you know what the answer is? Come back next week and we will see it together. So just a quick takeaway for tonight because we don't have time to get into it. I want to remind you that Jehoshaphat really was a great leader. But one of the things is that he was not a strong leader. What I mean by that is that he was a great leader in that he secured the nation's borders. He strengthened the military. He had a personal relationship with the Lord and holiness and he created this revival that swept across the nation there was a love of the word of God and the the pagan idols were torn down and I mean just all this good stuff was happening but when he was face to face with somebody who wanted to manipulate him he was very easily manipulated because he had a desire for something that was really impossible at the time. It was impossible to reconcile Judah and Israel without Israel's repentance and proving long-term fruit bearing. And yet he ignored all that, created some very, very serious problems. It was a noble desire, but he really should have waited until the nation of Israel was exhibiting genuine repentance but instead he got ahead of God and next week we'll see the rest of the story so my exhortation tonight as we go be careful Paul said to the Romans as much as is possible with you live at peace with all men and it's good to be able to look to somebody and say yes I forgive you and yes we're okay now But it's a whole different thing to open your life back up to a person who has already damaged you and hurt you, but they've said sorry. But sorry is not enough. Genuine repentance and the proving of repentance through long-term bearing of good fruit needs to take place before forgiveness turns into restoration of relationship. And Jehoshaphat has learned that the hard way, and you'll see more next week. So, Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And whoever among us needed the various exhortations that we received tonight, Lord, maybe many of us, would you let your word fall on hearts tonight that are fertile and ready to bear a harvest of righteousness? Lord, it's so easy to nod our heads and to say amen and then to turn around and continue in sinful patterns. And tonight, Lord, we want to yield to you. We want to be people that make really good decisions based on truth, who are not easily manipulated by people who have strong personalities or know how to say what we want to hear. Ahab flattered Jehoshaphat just primed him to make a bad decision. And Lord, Jesus would never put us in that position. And so tonight I pray, God, that we would identify maybe some of the same patterns that we have in our life and seek you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the biblical wisdom to be able to make better decisions as we move forward, Lord. The greatest decision that each of us will make is the decision to confess our sin, to repent, receive Christ as our Savior, and lay hold of eternal life. And if there's anybody that needs to receive Christ tonight, Lord, let them cry out, confess their sin, 
repent in their heart and, and cry out and say, Jesus, I need you. I need to be saved. And Lord, your word promises you'll never turn anybody away. So thanks for this time. Let it bear good fruit. Keep us as we go and give us opportunity to walk in the things that we learned tonight, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray this out to the Lord tonight. My life is in the hand.